Have you ever watched a movie that stuck with you after it ended? Hell Up in Harlem, a 1970s classic, is one such film. It's a raw, action-filled story set in New York City's tough streets. This film is memorable for its mix of surprising, funny, and touching moments that have resonated with viewers. Think back to when you first saw this film. Maybe you caught it when it first came out, or perhaps you found it years later. Either way, it's a movie that tends to linger in your mind. It's not just the plot that stays with you, but also the personal connections it brings up. Now, let's hear about your experiences. Does this movie remind you of a particular time in your life, or is it linked to someone important or a special event? We're keen to hear your stories. Please share them below. Your personal stories add a unique perspective to how we view and enjoy the movie. Let's delve into the world of this movie and discover the stories it has sparked in those who watched it. Your input is not just comments, they're an important part of Hell Up in Harlem's story. The movie Hell Up in Harlem, directed by Larry Cohen and starring Fred Williamson, continues the trend of black exploitation films popular in the early 1970s. Williamson plays the same character as in Black Caesar, this time battling a corrupt district attorney and trying to fix things with his dad, played by Julius Harris. This film mixes action and drama, but isn't as intense as the first one. Although the title suggests it's all about Harlem, much of the action takes place elsewhere, which might confuse some viewers. Williamson has a strong presence, but his acting isn't very varied. Harris, however, gives a more detailed performance, making the movie more interesting. Deerville Martin and Margaret Avery also add to the story. Martin plays a former ally who turns into a priest, and Avery is Sister Jennifer, a character who, despite not being fully developed, brings something extra to the story. The directing and editing of the movie have been criticized. The editing can seem choppy, making the story hard to follow at times. Cohen's writing goes back and forth between being rough and too emotional, which might not appeal to everyone. Fans of black exploitation films will like this movie's connection to its time. It's enjoyable for those who are into classic movies of this genre like Dolmite, Blackula, and Foxy Brown. However, people who prefer modern crime dramas might find this movie outdated. In short, Hell Up in Harlem is a typical film of its genre. It's not the best example of black exploitation cinema, but it shows what this genre was like. The acting, especially by Harris, is good, but the movie might not be for everyone, especially if they're not used to 1970s black exploitation films. Larry Cohen's innovative filming techniques were particularly notable in the making of this film. Sharing crew and equipment with another project, It's Alive, Cohen faced a unique challenge due to Fred Williamson's limited availability. This constraint led to a distinctive approach in filmmaking. Most of the film's scenes were shot using a stand-in for Williamson, with his actual presence limited to close-up shots. These close-ups were filmed in Los Angeles, aligning with Williamson's location at the time, while the broader scenes took place in New York. This method not only demonstrated Cohen's adaptability as a director, but also highlighted the practical aspects of film production. The connection between Williamson and Deerville Martin added another layer to the film. Martin, known for his contributions to the genre, brought a sense of camaraderie and shared history to the project. This friendship likely influenced their on-screen dynamics, enriching the film's narrative and character interactions. Originally titled Black Caesar's Sweet Revenge, the film underwent a name change before its release. This original title suggested a more direct continuation of the Black Caesar storyline, emphasizing the theme of vengeance. The eventual title shift to its current name broadened the film's appeal, moving away from being perceived as merely a sequel and allowing it to stand on its own merit. In conclusion, the production of this film showcases the ingenuity and resourcefulness of filmmakers in the 1970s, Cohen's ability to work around Williamson's schedule, the camaraderie among cast members, and the evolution of its title all contribute to the film's unique place in cinema history. Fred Williamson, the main actor in the movie, had a really varied career. Before he became an actor, he was a professional American football player. He played for the Kansas City Chiefs and was in the first Super Bowl against the Green Bay Packers. This part of his life is interesting because his athletic skills and discipline might have helped him play tough, streetwise characters in movies. Before he got into acting, Williamson was set to be in a film called Snowballs. This movie was talked about in a 1984 issue of Variety. It was supposed to be directed by Ray Arsenault with Williamson and Jackson Davis acting in it. 
They started making it in Banff and Calgary with Rickman Films, but there's no information about it ever being finished or released. This shows that sometimes projects in the movie industry don't always work out. Williamson's move from sports to movies is similar to what other famous people did during that time, especially in the black exploitation genre. This brought a special quality to those movies as actors like Williamson used their real-life backgrounds in their roles. It also shows how actors come from different backgrounds, making the movie industry diverse and interesting. To sum up, Fred Williamson's switch from football to movies makes his role in this movie more interesting. His ability to adapt from being a sports star to a movie star was common for actors in the 1970s who often used their real-life experiences in their acting. This, along with the story about the unfinished snowballs, shows how Williamson's life was as exciting and full of surprises as the roles he played. In the creation of this film, Mindy Miller made her first credited appearance playing the girlfriend of Fred Williamson, the lead actor. This role marked the beginning of her journey in the film industry. Interestingly, during the production, Miller and Williamson were in a romantic relationship, adding a layer of authenticity to their on-screen chemistry. The film's connections extend beyond the American cinema landscape. In 1979, Variety reported the commencement of Do Nell Stell, a project featuring Williamson alongside notable actors such as Bo Svensson and Arthur Kennedy. However, this Italian production, despite its promising start, seemingly never reached completion. This situation reflects the often unpredictable nature of film production, where not all projects see the light of day. Larry Cohen, the driving force behind the film, had a deep appreciation for the musical elements in cinema. His admiration for the soundtrack of Black Caesar, particularly the work of James Brown, led him to approach Brown for scoring this movie. However, American International Pictures' previous dissatisfaction with Brown's work for another film resulted in his music being rejected for this project. Brown, undeterred, repurposed his compositions into a solo album titled The Payback. Notably, this album, initially intended to be the film's soundtrack, became Brown's best-selling record. This incident underscores the unpredictable intersections between music and film industries and how creative work can find success in unexpected ways. These aspects of the film's background Miller's debut, the unfulfilled Italian project, and the twist in its musical journey reveal the multifaceted nature of movie production. They demonstrate the personal connections, international influences, and artistic collaborations that shape a film, sometimes leading to outcomes different from the initial vision.